book of Proverbs. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we praise you. You are worthy of all praise. There is no one aside from you. You alone are God. And with our, with our, our lives, our very lives, our full lives, we want to turn our attention to you and give you the glory that you deserve from, from us. Not only have you made us, you sent your son and through him you saved us and made us your own. We are blessed so fully we can't even fully express our gratitude and the praise you deserve. Thank you. Would you please now help us with your word so that we make it our own and it becomes alive and real in us by your Spirit's work. We ask for this in the precious name of our Savior, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, are you ready for a Lord of the Rings illustration? It's been a few months, right? Right after the climax of the story, when the ring is finally destroyed, Frodo is hanging on by one hand from a rock cliff over a river of lava. Sam, the ultimate faithful companion, throws himself on the ground at the top of the cliff, reaches down and tells Frodo to take his hand. And it seems in that moment that Frodo will be saved. But there's still a choice to be made. Frodo's will gets involved. He's so tired. He's borne so much pain and trouble. He's wearied of life to the point that he seems to be thinking that it might even be easier and best to just slip away. And while Frodo hesitates, Sam becomes more insistent. Don't you let go, he yells at Frodo. Frodo grasps for his friend's hand and the two escape the exploding mountain. Life may not feel this dramatic to any of us. I mean, does anything get more dramatic than a, than a lake of lava below your feet? It's like the ultimate uh, dynamic, you know, the most dramatic thing. But regardless of how life feels, whether it feels slow or not very dramatic, the choices we face in life, they have a lot at stake. And in the rest of Proverbs chapter 1, we find someone holding out their hand to us, calling to us while we wake up to our own precarious situation, telling us to take their hand, promising that they will lead us to safety. The person calling us to this is the Lady Wisdom. Wisdom, famously personified anthropomorphized, turned into a person so that we can relate to her in an appropriate degree. She's personified as the loveliest and most faithful of women in the book of Proverbs. She's the picture of nobility and dignity. She's powerful. She's truth in motion, a servant of God who teaches humans the contours of reality in God's world. Look what it says about her in verse 24. I have stretched out my hand. We're going to get more context on that verse in a moment, but make no mistake, wisdom is calling for your hand. She's calling for my hand. She's crying out to us, don't let go. Don't slip away. Don't turn aside. She's calling, take my hand. And that's the question for us today. Will we take her hand or not? It's a choice. Your will is involved. And here's our proposition. Take Lady Wisdom's hand before it's too late, and she will lead you to safety. Take her hand. She's holding it out. Take her hand before it's too late. Someday it will be too late. Take her hand, and she will lead you to a place of safety. So we should know then, what is Lady Wisdom doing? Why does Lady Wisdom offer us her hand? 
And let's answer three questions about what she's doing and offering her hand to us. First of all, she is calling out. She's calling all of us. She's calling everyone. She's calling all the time. And so if you're not inclined to listen, please perk up. She's calling you. Have you ever experienced an especially aggressive salesperson? Have you ever seen this? The kind of person you almost give your business to them just to get them to stop, to get off your back. And we've experienced this from time to time. Once, when our oldest children were still quite young, Grace was walking through the King of Prussia Mall, and a woman selling hair extensions came up and and put something in our second daughter Hope's hair. Put it in so fast, Grace didn't even know it happened. It was some kind of like a ponytail or something. And then she stood back, and, 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 and Grace couldn't even react till it happened. And, and the saleswoman was saying how cute it was, and Grace had to admit it was really cute. But needless to say, Hope was not amused. She, uh, she made her most pouty face, I think, possible. Another time, Grace and I were with a group of friends walking in New York City, and we were walking through an outdoor fair, and we walked past a massage stand, and the salesperson on the street literally began giving one of our friends a back rub as we were walking down the street. So he's just following behind my friend, rubbing his shoulders like this. And our friend just kind of, I think if it was me, I'd say, don't, don't touch me. But our friend was so good-natured, just let him do it. He's kind of sheepishly smiling. We're walking down the street for a while, and this guy's rubbing his back. It went on way longer than it should have gone on. <laughs> you, know, you wouldn't think that approach, I mean, wouldn't you think that approach is a little creepy? But apparently, he must have had success with it because he, he was doing it. That's a pushy salesman. Let's read the text so we can appreciate just how aggressive Lady Wisdom is being toward all of humanity. So, so Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. So where has wisdom located herself? Where has she located herself? And, and we're, again, we're given this metaphor, wisdom being personified as this noble woman, and, and life, our lives being personified as a, as a city. And so we can see where, where is wisdom positioned? That's a big part of these two verses, the geography of it. She's outside. She's in the street. She's not hidden away in a corner. She's out in the street. But she's not just in the street. Think about a residential city street, maybe in Lancaster or another city. And maybe think about older cities uh, before cars. You know, some of those streets are quite narrow. You're right up on the other houses. And she's, she's outside in the street, but not just the side streets, right? She's in the outdoor markets. She's with the people at Roots. And she's on the corner of the busiest streets crying out. She's at the entrance of the city gate where there was probably a large square for the citizens to gather. If you've ever been to an older city on this earth, that might help you think this through. Any city will do, whether it's Philadelphia or Lancaster, but maybe something older can capture it even better. Grace and I had the opportunity a few years ago to visit the city of Florence in Italy. And I tend to think of that place when I think of this because some of the streets are narrow and there's barely anyone on it. Although if you call out, perhaps people in other homes could hear you. But then you come to this famous market and the place is bustling with people. They're all over the place. They're excited about the food. Some of them are working. Some of them are tourists. Uh, and it's just, it's just this, this busy and beautiful place with amazing food. And then you come to the, one of the main churches and those churches, those main churches are usually located on a sprawling courtyard. People going in every direction and, and, and street entertainers out there trying to gather a crowd around themselves. You get a sense. These are all the places that live Lady Wisdom positions herself and cries out. She's not hidden away. She's not a light under a bushel. She's out there in the open. Here's a lesson for us. Life 
requires wisdom, and we don't inherently have wisdom. We're not born with wisdom, but wisdom is not hard to find. We may not have it yet, but it's not hard to find. Not only is she everywhere, but she's also pleading with everyone and and seeking to find someone who will just listen to her. Do you ever think of it that way, that that's how accessible wisdom is? She's completely available and eager for us to respond to her. Do you believe that? Maybe the reason some of us lack wisdom is not because she's so hard to find, but because we're not turning toward her. We're turning away from her. We're finding reasons not to listen to her. Maybe that's what's going on. And as always, context helps us too. Remember last week when Steve showed us how the Proverbs are especially pictured as a father teaching his son. And if you look back at verse 8 in chapter 1, you see the setting. Hear, my son, your father's instruction. But then if you look forward to the same thing in chapter 2, verse 1, you see it there again, talking about father to son. So this portion right in the middle of it about lady wisdom, it's in the context of a father quietly or, or privately. He's in his house. He's teaching his son about the ways of the world. This son is what life is like. This is the nature of human existence. Wisdom is out there. It's not hard to find. Isn't this juxtaposition just fascinating? He's in his home teaching his son, but he's teaching him about what wisdom is like in the world. Do you see what's happening? The father's teaching his son. These truths I'm teaching you about what God's world is like are found all around you. Hear my principles. Hear my voice. But then go out there and open your eyes and you will see wisdom all over the place to the point where you can never deny its reality. The truth is so stark, it's so real, it's unavoidable. You have to put blinders on not to see it. You cannot not hear wisdom unless you work to ignore and avoid her. And when we see how universally wisdom makes herself known and available, we're probably reminded of a related truth from Romans chapter 1. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. You see, all the blindness to God in this world is simply people choosing to rebel by ignoring the obvious. Every star in the sky points to the majesty and power of God. Each day that comes and goes speaks to his eternality and to his faithfulness. Every inspiration and expiration of breath instructs us in his love and his provision. Every moment we are aware of our being exhorts us to remember the design and purpose for which we were created. There is more evidence for God than for any other thing, and to deny Him is to deny existence itself and is ultimately incoherent. Don't let the world try to tell you otherwise. Don't let anyone try to tell you otherwise. There is no more obvious fact than that God is. Take Lady Wisdom's hand. Wisdom is the handmaiden of God, and I mean that in a perfectly positive way. And she also is self-evident, teaching us first and foremost that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Take her hand before it's too late, and she will lead you to safety. Wisdom is unavoidable, should not be ignored. People are working hard at ignoring her. Sometimes even we are guilty of that. She's calling out. She's calling to me. She's calling to you today. So she's calling. But what else is she doing? Well, she's warning us. Wisdom is warning us. Let's read Proverbs chapter 1. We'll start with verse 22 and go down to verse 32. Proverbs 1, 22 through 32. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. 
because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. Let's focus first on verses 22 to 23. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Notice that everyone she's calling out to is in trouble here. They are simple, which is like being foolish because someone's naive, simple, immature. Or they're scoffers. They're foolish because they're malevolent. They're against They make fun of truth and righteousness. Or they're just called fools here. So maybe it's a mix of naivety and malevolence. Presumably, those that have already taken Lady Wisdom's hand don't need to respond because they already have. So they're not addressed in her call. But again, the universality of where wisdom is and how clearly she calls and who she calls out to is a big hint to us. You may even see it already in a sense This is an old covenant gospel call to the world. Because here is the state of humanity. Simple, foolish, and scoffing. And here is the stance of God to the world. Available, clear, calling out. Calling from the turn to Him. Calling out for humanity to turn away from sin and turn to His Son, the Lord Jesus. Notice again how the Scripture uses language that puts the focus squarely on the active will of these sinners. As much as we as a church affirm the sovereignty of God in salvation, and we see that as primary, we also affirm the real choice of humans. Look at the language. The simple ones love being simple. They love their naivety. They love their immaturity. They they love it. See, it's active. It's a choice. It's what they want. Fools hate knowledge, the Scriptures say. They hate it. They don't want it. God's saying, here I am. Wisdom's saying, here I am. The, The fool is saying, no, I don't want it. I reject it. And the scoffers, what do they do? They delight in their scoffing. They take enjoyment in it. This is, the, this is their most fun thing that they do. This is what animates them in life, is taking truth and righteousness, truth about God, revelation about God, and mocking it. That, that justifies them, they feel. It, it puts them in a good position. It strengthens them. They feel bold when they do that. They feel confident when they do that. Because the consequences haven't come yet. I've lost my place. (laughs) You see the the fool and the simple and the scoffer, they have choice and they're choosing to turn away from wisdom. They have volitional ability. A popular term these days to indicate the ability to choose and to act is the word agency. They have personal agency, the ability to, to choose and to act. But they use that ability, God-given, they use it to ignore wisdom's cry. This is important for us to know and to internalize. Because just as the father was teaching his son in our story here, it's important for us to know that when we hold out the gospel in this world, when when Christians hold out Christ and, and we say, look, God is calling. Look what he's done. He loved the world so much he gave his son. And can't you see? And here he is. And if you'll turn to him, you'll be forgiven and saved. He'll, he'll put his spirit in you. 
It's important for us to know that when we do that, when we hold out the gospel, that many will turn away in their love of foolishness. Others will turn away because they hate the truth. Still others will turn away because they hate us and want to scoff at us. We must know this, that when we hold out Christ in this world, we're not surprised at the world's response. We're not shocked by it. We're not discouraged by it. We're not shaken by it. And we need to know this so that every time someone comes to Christ, we see the miracle that that is. What God has to overcome in order to save that person and raise them to a new life in himself. Every one of us should be amazed that anyone comes to Christ And whenever someone comes to Christ, whenever we see a baptism here, we ought to be shouting in celebration to God because it's the greatest miracle. But we also need to know the status of humanity, its active rebellion and resistance against the call of God. We need to know it for another reason too, because it's in us. It still fights against the work that God has done in us. It's the flesh. It's sometimes called the sinful nature. And it wars against the work of God in us. It rises up in us. And one way to think about this is we need to forsake the world's approach to personal responsibility. The world is in such a therapeutic state, if I can put it that way, such a self-centered, even narcissistic state that everything is about the individual, the self. And in that approach to life, the world, and it's not a biblical approach, but in that approach to life, the world finds every reason to excuse ungodly attitudes and sinful actions in us. My father was a bad model. My mother was a bad model. I was mistreated. This is my personality type. I'm just like this. This is what I'm like. That's the way we do things from where I'm from. It's my family of origin. It's my place of origin. It's okay because I I can't help it. That's just what I am. Or I don't have that gift, so I can't do that thing. Or I don't have that gift, so uh, oh well. Now, every one of those statements that I, I said can be used rightly. And they probably should stir up our sympathies when we see them because we understand that it's hard to overcome a bad model or when you've been mistreated or wrong. That can be difficult to interpret that properly. But at some point, we're responsible. And what's really going on is, is not that we've just been acted upon and we're just We're just victims of the situation around us. Oh, oh, no, no, no. God is speaking too loudly. Wisdom is speaking too loudly. Jesus is speaking too loudly to make these excuses. And we have to reject the world's thinking and approach to personal responsibility. None of, of those excuses are a reason for God's people to forsake wisdom. Every one of those statements might be used rightly, but they can, all, all, they, they can be and they often are used destructively. You see, we have agency by the grace of God, and we're faced with a choice. Will we take wisdom's hand or not? Too often when people face their own inability, they say, I can't, so I won't. When we face our own inability, when we see our failure in sin over and over again, when we see sin rise up in us, the flesh, and we give into it, and we say, oh, I'm so discouraged, I, I, I just can't do it, so I won't do it, and we look for other reasons to excuse our sin, that's a bad place to be. When we look at our own inability and we say, I can't, so I won't. That's faithless. It's unbelieving. It's, it's not taking wisdom's hand. It's slapping her hand away and turning away from her. But God's people should know better when we're faced with our sin failures and our own foolishness. In faith we say, I can't, but he can. I can't, so I run to the Lord where there is grace, and there I find the power and the ability to apply wisdom and forsake foolishness and to become more like my Savior. Our growth 
is contingent on his grace. And the sooner we begin to understand that our response always needs to be faith-filled. It needs to be, I can't, but he can. I can't, but he has. I can't, but he will. So that it's no longer an excuse for our sin, but an opportunity to access the grace of God and grow to be more like Christ and to show that when we're weak, he's strong. Whenever we do that, he gets the glory for it. And we have taken Lady Wisdom's hand, and she's led us to safety in those moments. The warning here is really the center portion of this passage, verses 20 to 33. And I think the best effect may come from us simply reading it again, because it's so powerful. And I'm going to add, I'll make a few notes at the end of this portion before we move on to our third point. But I mainly want to reread this for you. Verses 24, we'll start in verse 24 and go through to 32. Let these words settle on us. They're meant to have a sobering effect. They're meant to drive us to wisdom, drive us to our Savior. And so let them have the right effect. Verse 24 and following. Because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. This is, pure and simple, a warning, a dire warning. And it is loving and gracious of God to put it here for us to see so that we can be responsive to it. This is God's grace to us. This warning is God's grace to us. What's funny is when you read through those words in, in today's world, it, it, it sounds like the worst croaking of the, of the most obnoxious bullfrog you've ever heard in, in light of the way the world listens to things. But it's not. It's It's the voice of the beautiful, the noble, the lovely Lady Wisdom warning us of the outcome of our natural way if we don't take her hand. So just a few notes about this warning. First, note that since the foolish have mocked wisdom, she will mock them when the consequences of their foolishness come upon them. And that may seem cruel at first, but if it seems cruel, it only seems that way because we're not seeing the capital nature of this crime. For the foolish to ignore and avoid and scoff at, to spit at, to turn away, to, to denigrate wisdom in her pure and sincere efforts to save them is more reprehensible than murder. It is the rejection of God himself, and it is the rejection of God's salvation itself. This is a capital expense, and this is supposed to grip us. The idea that wisdom would mock us if we ignore her should grip and shake us into repentance and turning. Now, a moment ago, you're distracted because I said capital expense, and I meant to say capital offense. Yes, I slipped up. You got it. You nailed it. <laughs> Thank you for being so active and listening. Another note, repentance is required of us, certainly when we come to Christ, but even through the Christian life, there's a, there's a humility that, that should be marking us through turning to God again and again in repentance, to going to the cross, seeing that grace again, 
Yes, we, we have it in Christ, but we need to be aware of it. It's one of the reasons we come to the Lord's table regularly so we can say, I need this grace. I need it now. I need it today. I need it for yesterday and the day before. I need it for this morning. I need it for this moment. Repentance is required too often today. Even Christians fail to repent. It's not just the world failing to come to Christ in the beginning. It's Christians failing to walk in repentance. We can behave abominably in many scenarios that harm others, but then never take responsibility. And we just justify ourselves like the world does. Now imagine someone. Let's think this through. I'll just give you one scenario, just one. And maybe you can see yourself in it to some degree. Imagine someone running away from Christ, living in immorality and violence and greed for a number of years, for a couple of years. Then one day, showing up in the church building and acting like nothing ever happened. You speak to them and they say, yeah, I just decided to come back. I thought I should come back. Unaffected, unengaged with the realities of what's been going on in their world. Would you rejoice at the grace of God here? Or would you be concerned that this person has no idea of the reality of sin and the warnings of wisdom and what Christ had to do so that they could be saved? I think that's where we should be. It's it's not just good that they showed up in church. I mean, okay, that's good. And I think from our perspective, we ought to be patient and gracious because only God knows the heart. But we're looking for, we're waiting to see a real repentance that is sorrowful for sin and says, how can I be so foolish to turn away from the Christ who died for me? And there's a brokenness and a turning and a a confession and a humility that says, I I was so foolish. I, I was the prodigal. I ran, but I'm back now and because, I, because I see that I need Christ. This is my only way to salvation. Let us not pretend to be able to not repent. This should be part of our lives. Repentance is required. Now, another note in verses 31 to 32 that the fools eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices and they are killed by their turning away and that the complacency destroys them. Their complacency destroys them. In other words, note here that there is built into foolishness in life. If you're foolish in life, there's built into that way consequences. And and that makes perfect sense because God made the world to be one way. And if we refuse to live in the way that He's created the world, if we refuse to walk in the reality that He's made in, in the shape of and the contours of the way life really is, if we refuse to do that, there are dire consequences, dire consequences. I'll pick up An easy and extreme one. It's one that we we need to talk about uh, fairly frequently because of the insanity of our society today. I was listening to an interview with someone who transitioned their sex. They thought they could do that. They thought that that was a possibility, that the sex that God assigned to them, they could change it. And when they saw the consequences of that, which were brutal, physically brutal, emotionally brutal, mentally brutal, they decide to detransition. And it's clear they're in a better spot, but this person is still facing massive consequences. That's an easy one because it's, it's, it's someone who tried to change their biological sex given by God as a gift, along with the gift of life. We don't assign ourselves life and we don't assign ourselves sex. God does that. And it's a glorious gift. But this is true across the board. When we live foolishly, when we live against wisdom, when we slap wisdom's hand and and spit at her hand and turn away from her hand, we're inviting the consequences of that way of life. And and this is important to note because 
we need to remind ourselves and be refreshed in the reality that we, we can't just decide to reject God's way and expect it to go well. That, it's not true for me. It's not true for you. There are brutal consequences to face for walking in a foolish way. And the final note here is that at some point it becomes too late to repent. That's true in in life with Christ because the end of the age will come and when Christ returns it will be too late. It's true in life too with wisdom because the Scripture says, Terror strikes like a storm and calamity comes like a whirlwind. But the good news right now is that Lady Wisdom is still calling. And if you'll open your ears and your eyes, you will see and hear her. And it's not too late for anyone here to turn to wisdom and walk in her way. Take Lady Wisdom's hand before it's too late and she will lead you to safety. Take her hand. So Lady Wisdom is calling us, and she's warning us. But what else is she doing? Well, she's making a promise. She's making a promise, and this is quite a promise. Now, this promise that Lady Wisdom makes, it is, I mean, it's massive. It's immense. It's, it's, it's beyond human. It's, it's just incredible. But it's the kind of promise that we need in this world, and that gives us hope in this world. And I'm going to put it on the screen. It's that last verse from our text today. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Oh my, think about that. If you turn to wisdom and embrace her, and earlier she said she'll she'll give you some of her spirit, she'll put her words in you. Incredible. And, And here it says, whoever listens to me, dwell secure, be at ease without dread of disaster. If I told you that you could have enough money said you'd never face financial pressure for your entire life, the rest of your life. That would be great, right? At least those troubles would be solved. At least, at least the category of financial troubles would go away. And if you could get a relationship formula, and I could package a relationship formula for you and say, every time you have a conflict, do this, and it'll work out great. And everybody will love you and be happy. And, oh, that's great. That's great. Now all the relationship problems go away. So I got my financial problems dealt with and my relationship problems dealt with. And let's take another one. Let's say, let's say we, could, um, we could ensure that the, the nation will always be secure and never corrupt. Now that would be a miracle, wouldn't it? And let's say that would be the case. It's, oh my goodness, that would be amazing. And what do, you, what do you start to realize? You start to realize this kind of sounds like heaven on earth, doesn't it? Lady Wisdom is promising heaven. Now, we've talked about this before. The Proverbs aren't commands. They're deep principles showing us the shape of reality in God's economy, according to God's design. In other words, this is not to say that those who take Lady Wisdom's hand are transported away from all the troubles of earth and ushered immediately forever into the throne room of God. And when you see the story of Job or you read the book of Ecclesiastes, both books themselves being inspired wisdom literature, much like Proverbs, when you read those stories, you know that even the wise are not always secure and at ease or without dread in this world. In fact, you see the opposite, don't you? Sometimes the righteous face troubles because they are righteous. And so what we have here from Lady Wisdom is a general promise. It's a general promise, but it's also a deep promise. It's general, but it's deep, and it's also eternal. It's an eternal promise. So in general, those who take Lady Wisdom's hand will become wise, and they're generally better off than those who reject her and persist in their foolishness. We've already talked about the destructive way of a foolish life, of living foolishly. Of persisting in foolishness. Yes, if you reject that and you embrace Lady Wisdom, you're going to probably generally do better. Usually that's going to be the case. The wise will generally have more security in life and more ease because of their wisdom. And, and they'll have a lack of sense of dread. 
which is a glorious thing and a terrible thing. If you've ever had a sense of dread that you lived with for a while, the physiological nature of that, you just feel it's terrible. And the wise will generally have less of that. Now, in this fallen world, we know that these things will touch us. But in general, and in comparison, the wise are better off than the foolish in this world. But this isn't simply a general promise of life in this world. This general promise is also a deep promise. And what I mean is that it speaks to far more than the surface level concerns. It means that even when facing, even when facing fearful and dreadful things, if we walk with wisdom, if we take her hand and we walk with her and we let her save us, when she says, don't you slip away, don't you let go, you take my hand, and we take that hand and we walk with her, even when facing fearful and dreadful things, the wise will be steady. One thinks of the three friends of Daniel facing the fiery furnace from Daniel chapter 3. They told the king that, that God was able to deliver them. But then they essentially say something like this. Even if God doesn't deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, we will not serve your gods or worship them. Now that's confidence. That's a sense of security and dwelling secure and walking without dread in this life. They're facing the fiery furnace with the most powerful man in the world has the ability to to kill them or to save them. And they say to him, we're we're not going to worship your gods. That's a security. They've taken Lady Wisdom by the hand and we're walking with her. You see? Or think of Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail, beaten, thrown into the inner prison. The Scripture says their feet were fastened in the stocks. It must have been pitch black in there. It must have been cold. It must have been horrible. They, they must have been tempted to despair. Look at the trouble that had come upon them because they were following Christ. They had thought they had taken Lady Wisdom by the hand. They, 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 they turned to the Lord, and they're doing what He called them to do. But look what's happened to them. Isn't this dreadful? Isn't this a lack of security? But wh- were they dreading what would come on the next day? It seems likely that they took counsel with one another and decided to encourage their own hearts in the Lord. And in the midst of that terrible place and that terrible situation, they prayed and they sang. And Acts 16 tells us the prisoners were listening to them. Can you imagine this scene? Sunk in the depths of a people filled with despair, they're right in the midst of it. They should have been the ones with the most despair of all. And yet they sing and pray and everybody else tunes their ear What's this song? What's this sound of singing? What's this? What are these faith raised words? What is this? It's the sound of men who had taken Lady Wisdom by the hand and were dwelling securely. You see how deep this promise is? Don't you want that in life? That no matter what comes, You're dwelling securely. Take Lady Wisdom by the hand. Turn to the Savior. This is a deep promise that is always available to God's people who take the hand of Lady Wisdom. And of course, it's an eternal promise as well. The fullness of these promises will be ours in the end. In the new heavens and the new earth, they will be completely fulfilled. We've hinted at some of this throughout. But the bottom line is that when we take Lady Wisdom's hand, she leads us to Jesus and the grace that he gives us on the cross. Take Lady Wisdom's hand before it's too late, and she will lead you to safety. Ushers, would you please come and man these tables? We're going to come to the Lord's Supper here in just a few moments. Now, if you have trusted Jesus and been baptized in his name, then come to these tables with us. And join us at the Lord's Supper. If you have not yet trusted the Lord, if you have not yet been baptized in the name of Jesus, don't come yet, but first come to Him and come to the waters of baptism. Turn away from sin 
take the hand of Lady Wisdom, turn to Jesus, and you'll have a depth of security. And knowing that your sins are forgiven, that the Spirit of God will take up residence with you. He'll give you His Spirit. He'll make you new. Come and turn from sin and be baptized in His name. And then you will join us at these tables forever in this life and at the Lamb's Supper in the end. The state of humanity is foolishness. That's the natural state of man. It's rebellion against God. It's, it's willful. And as God's people, we know that we have often fallen into foolishness ourselves. And here again, wisdom points us to the cross of Christ. Would you stand with us, please? It seems so impossible, doesn't it? How can the death of the perfect, Jesus, God's Son, how can that be the wisdom of God? How can an execution be wisdom? How can this slaughter of the most innocent one, how can that become wisdom for us? How do we look at that and not think, that's incredibly foolish. That's, that's an L. That's a loss. You lost that one. Why are you boasting about it? It's not wisdom, it's foolishness. It seems that way to the world, doesn't it? But we know. When we hear Lady Wisdom saying, foolish ones, simple ones, scoffers, take my hand, take my hand. We know, we know that that's us. We've been simple, and, and we've been foolish, and we've been scoffers. And the only way we can come and know the wisdom of God is if God in His wisdom sends His Son to die in our place so that our sins are paid for and we get life. Today, when you lift the bread and the cup, you are testifying to Jesus and his work, and you are being wise. When you partake of our Lord, you are taking Lady Wisdom's hand, and when you take her hand, you will enjoy the blessing that she gives. You will dwell secure. You will be at ease. You will live without fear of dread because you have Jesus Christ forever.